you asked me what, what my purpose was, and my purpose, I guess, after a long journey, uh, going through struggles, uh, I didn't even know the definition of purpose. Uh, but going through a lot of struggles, a lot of defining moments, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, time after time after time and after time, and after time and after time and after time again, uh, I started realizing what my purpose was. Um, so my sophomore year, I started going to a, a Bible study that one of the local missionaries would put on for, the, for our baseball team. And I, uh, all of a sudden, at, at that point, started to wonder if there was more to life than just uh, baseball in school. That everything I'd worked for and lived for was, uh, was meaningless. At age 50, I found myself alone, um, my wealth taken away, my, my family, and I realized at that time that uh, everything I had worked for just didn't mean anything. And um, God showed me that there's a higher purpose in life. Ooh, yeah, it's very simple, you know, as a I'm a being, we're all beings created by God. We have no right to boast about anything that we can do. All of our gifts are given to us by the Lord. And um, you know, it's, it's easy to re re relate to as a baseball player because not, not everyone can do what, what I could do on the baseball field. And that was just a, it was a gift from God. There's nothing I did to earn it. It was just a simple uh, blessing from the Lord that he put in my life. Um, to glorify Him, and it's, it was my purpose in life, and still is my purpose in life, to use the gifts He has given me for His glory. I definitely know that God has a purpose for my life. Good morning, men. Good morning. And uh, welcome to Man in the Mirror, Men's Bible Study where we always have room for one more guy. Let's go ahead and uh, greet a couple of uh, groups that we have not talked about before. And uh, the first one goes to Men on a Mission at uh, St. John Missionary Baptist Church in Knoxville. Uh, ten men who meet on Saturday mornings uh, with us. Uh, Paul Garrett is their leader. Uh, we're looking for an area director in Knoxville, by the way. And then the second shout-out goes to a new group today, the Camilla First Assembly of God Men's Group, Camilla, First Assembly of God in Camilla, Georgia. Ten men who are meeting now, a new group on Wednesday nights at uh, 7 o'clock. And uh, we also need an area director in southern Georgia. And so uh, I wonder if you'd join me in welcoming these men as they are, are part of the Man in the Mirror Men's Bible Study. <laughs> One, two, three. Hoorah. Hoorah. Welcome, guys. We're glad to have you with us. Okay, so the series that we're in is The Man in the Mirror, Solving the 24 Problems Men Face. Today, we're going to talk about the chapter on purpose, Why Do I Exist? I'm a high school dropout, not proud of it. A lot of students drop out of high school, but I don't think that the reason why they drop out of high school is really that well understood. It's usually not because students are lazy or apathetic or losers, but it's more what happened in my case. So somewhere around the middle of my 10th grade year, about the time that our family dropped out of church, I began to become frustrated with all of the diversity that was taught in, in my high school. You go to biology class and they would tell me well, what, what the, the, the slime that I had evolved out of, and then you would go to English literature class and they would talk about the world of uh, literature, and then you go to geography class, and they would discuss the crust uh, of the earth and the stuff it was made of. And where I went to high school, nobody ever tried to bring a unity to all of that diversity. And so I couldn't see any purpose to life. I couldn't see 
how it fit together. And so it, it, by the time I was a senior, I only needed 12th grade English to graduate. So in my boredom, I signed up for DE and worked half a day and went to school half a day. And by the middle of my senior year, by January, that got to be too much and I quit. And so I wanted to have, uh, the, the, the driving force for my life all through high school was I, I wanted my life to count. I wanted there to be a purpose for my life, but I couldn't, I couldn't see any purpose. I couldn't see any reason for existence. And so in, in utter despair, I just dropped out. Now, different people, different men drop out at different ages. I dropped out at 18, but I also meet men who drop out at 28. I, I've met men who dropped out at 35. I've met men who dropped out at 42, at 50, nice round number. I've, I've, I've met more men who have dropped out at the age of 55 and older by far than all of the others combined. Because men often and this is the thesis for the chapter in the, in the Man in the Mirror. And by the way, it was the original thesis too. And, and the thesis is that, that most men do not know God's purpose for their life or their purpose is too small. And so today, what I want us to do is, is look at this, this topic and the message is really for, especially for the man who maybe has never known God's purpose for his life, or maybe he's confused about what that purpose is. Uh, maybe, maybe you feel like you've plateaued in your life, or maybe you've dropped out. Maybe you know what your purpose is, and so today this will just be a good refresher for you to to. Uh, further clarify or confirm God's purpose for your life. But a lot of men today are thinking this. They're thinking there must be more. A lot of men are thinking there's just got to be. There's just, there just must be more to life than this. So I love to set goals. So when I quit high school... Uh, I joined the Army. My dad drove me down to the enlistment office. He wasn't going to let me hang around the house. And uh, so I got to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and they had, I took the GED test, and they had a, uh, North Carolina State University had an extension right there on the beautiful campus of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So I started taking classes, looking for a purpose. And I remember in a, an English lit class studying for an examination, reading Shakespeare, Hamlet to be specific, and I ran across this line of verse. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And I, I remember thinking, Eureka, this is it. This is the most noble thought that I've ever heard uttered in my life. I'm going to adopt this as my credo. I'm going to build the purpose of my life, my existence around this. I'm going to try to do the right thing by every person I meet every day. And on that day, I became a moralist. That became the purpose of my life, to be a moralist. But I quickly began to meet, you know, anytime you join a new group, like the Chamber of Commerce or the Rotary Club, you begin to meet the other members. And so I began to meet the other moralists in the world. And I quickly realized that all moralists basically have one thing in common. None of them have any money. <laughs> and so I decided that I would also become a materialist and try to make some, some real money and uh, without giving up being a moralist, and so my purpose then became a, a, a little bit of an adaptation. I became a moral materialist. Or maybe a material moralist. And 
And then I began to set goals because I love goals. And the goals had to do with being moral and making money. And so, you know how it goes. You set a goal, you work real hard, six months pass, you meet the goal, there's a sense of euphoria. Two weeks later, the novelty wears off, and you have to do what? Set another goal. Set another goal, and the other goal has to be what? Bigger. Better. Better. Brighter, faster, higher, shinier, longer. All right? Then you work real hard for another six months on the new goal. You meet the goal. There's a sense of euphoria. Ah, everything I always wanted. Until two weeks go by and the novelty wears off. And then what happens? You have to set a new goal again. And again, that new goal has to be what? Bigger and better and all those things. And, and if you're like me and most men, then you have gone through that process, and you get to a point where you say, what is the purpose? <laughs> There's just got to be more. It just becomes kind of an unrelated string of, of these hollow victories, and you get increasingly frustrated as more and more is accomplished. There must be more. So setting and meeting goals is intoxicating, and I, and I love doing that. But here's the problem. The price of getting what you want is getting what you want. It just isn't enough. It just isn't enough. And so met goals without having a purpose that you are working toward is a formula for disillusionment, at best in confusion as well. And so there's a distinction between what and why. Uh, what we do is, is the goal. What we're pursuing is the goal. But then why we do what we do is the purpose. What is the reason behind that particular goal? Is it to make a lot of money? Is it to be a moral person? What I have discovered and most of you have discovered, and I hopefully, hopefully all of us will live by the understanding that purposes that are not linked to God and why God created us are doomed, are doomed to be disillusioning and not satisfying. And so, ask yourself, do my goals reflect my examination of life's larger meaning and God's purpose for my life. Do you know why God created you? Do you know why God created you? If, you, if you're not sure, you will have all the equipment you need to figure that out by the time you leave this morning. And if you do know, then you'll be able to confirm it or if you're a little fuzzy, you'll be able to clarify it by the time you meet this morning. This is the big idea. I will feel most alive, most useful, and most significant when I am doing what God created me to do. I will feel most alive, most useful, and most significant when I am doing what God created me to do. How happy would a lion be if he couldn't roar? How happy would an eagle be if he couldn't soar? How happy would a dolphin be if he couldn't jump? A fish if he couldn't swim? How happy would a man be if he can't do what he was created to do? God has a purpose for our lives. God has a purpose for your life. So, why do we exist? Why do we exist?
There was a time when I thought that my purpose in life, the reason that I existed, was to become financially independent. My values were, as we've talked about in previous messages, personal peace and affluence. I, I thought that if I could just accumulate enough uh, money to be financially independent, that that would, but it's not, a, it was not a purpose that was big enough uh, to, and it's certainly not why God created me, and, and so I became a cultural Christian, seeking the God that I wanted instead of the God who is. So let's take a look at why, uh, why we exist from God's perspective, from God's perspective, from the Word of God, and so let's begin at uh, Matthew chapter 22. Now, uh, this, this is a, a, a huge topic, and so on your, uh, I, there's no way we can drill down on every specific of this, but on your tables are some outlines. It's, it's called purpose outline, okay? And I'm going to flash it up on the screen. Same thing. And you can take this with you, but I want to just familiarize you a little bit with this. So you can see that we have, from this outline, we have eternal purpose and we have earthly purpose. And then, when you get to our earthly purpose, why we exist here in this life, there are, uh, there is a universal earthly purpose that applies to all men in all, in all time, at all times, in all ways. But there also is a sense in which each of us is unique, and God has a personal purpose for us. So what I wanna do uh, when we talk about why do we exist, all men, I want us to look at this Roman numeral 2a, our universal earthly purpose. You could call it either four purposes or one purpose with four parts, it doesn't make any difference. But it's the great commandment, the royal commandment, or the new commandment, the great commission, and the cultural mandate. And so here, these are the four purposes that apply to all men. And this is why we exist, uh, to do these four things. Let's take a look at the first one, Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might, all of your strength. The totality of your being, every ounce of your energy, the sum of your strength. Bring that to loving God. Augustine said, love God and do what you want. Jeremiah was out doing what prophets do one day. He was calling down burning sulfur and hellfire on all the sinners. Well, the pastors of the churches, the synagogues back then, the priests at the synagogue, the, the, the pastors, you know, they don't like it as so much when the prophets do this because the prophets are upsetting the sheep and the pastors, his calling is to do what? To calm the sheep. So one of them got really upset with Jeremiah, had him put in stocks overnight. Next day, let him out. And, and Jeremiah was lamenting to God. He said, God, I don't understand you. All I do, all day long, every day, I do exactly what you tell me to do. And what do I get? Insult, reproach. These people hate my guts. And then in chapter 20, verse 9, he turns his attention to his own private journal and he writes these words. He says, but if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Now that's loving God. That's the kind of passion that we were created to have, to have that kind of passion that kind of love for God. Secondly, to love one another. 
John chapter, uh, it, it says right here at the end of the Matthew passage, love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 5, he said, a new command I give you. All men will know you are my disciples if you, what? Perfect your theology. Theology is beautiful and important. All men will know you are my disciples if you can prove Christianity is true. All men will know you are my disciples if you can point out why the other guy is wrong in his theology. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, all men will know you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. So, loving God, loving people. These are the two universal purposes that relate to our relationships, our being, who we are. And then there are two more universal purposes for all men that relate to our, our tasks, our mission, what we do. The first one is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Leading people to Christ, helping them to grow in their faith, showing them how to abide in Christ, teaching them to love, teaching them to, 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 to serve others. And of course, to do that ourselves. Beginning with our own families first. And then the cultural mandate. This is, this is uh, God's command to, to tend the culture, to take care of his creation. This is where our families come in. Our work comes in. Our civic involvement comes in. Our, our participation in the governing processes comes in. And every vocation is holy to the Lord. There is no, how, how many of you have a concordance? How many, first of all, how many still carry a, a written Bible? Uh, okay, so how many of you have a, a concordance in those Bibles? All right. Would, would some of you look up all the references to the word secular in your concordance? Let's just see how many, how many times the Bible uses the word secular. Could, you, could a couple of you do that for me? And I'll, and I'll get back to you on that. So the idea here in the cultural mandate is, is that your job, for example, is it's not just a place that is a platform for you to do ministry. In other words, God does not intend for us to go to work and it be drudgery until the water break uh, in the middle of the morning where we can stand around the cooler and talk about Jesus and how cool he is with our friends. And then we, we trudge through the rest of the morning until we can take somebody to lunch and, and share the, the love of Jesus Christ with them and witness to them and then go back to work. That's not how it works. Every vocation is holy to the Lord. Every, if, you're, if you're a waiter, everybody that sits down at your table is a divine appointment, an opportunity for you to express the character of Jesus Christ to those people, even if you never say a word about it. If you're a salesman, uh, every appointment that you have is an opportunity to serve those people and give them uh, what, what, they, what they need, the best value to recommend what they need to solve the problems. If you're a manager, every time two of your em employees have a conflict and they come to you and you, you sit them down to resolve, it's a div that's a divine opportunity for you to show the reconciling power of the gospel in their lives. Now, how many of you found, looked up the word secular for me? Who, who looked up the word secular? Who tried to look up the, how many references? Zero. Zero? Small concordance. How about you? Zero? 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 Why? Well, because in the mind of God, there is no such thing as, as secular work. All, there is no sacred secular uh, distinction 
in the mind of God. We create one, but in the mind of God, everything we do is sacred. That's what the cultural mandate is all about. And these are the four universal purposes that God has for all of us, for all men. And these four, you know, per, ver, 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 easy for me to say, these four universal purposes are a gift. They're a gift. Turn with me to, if you would, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians. Let's see, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. These, God has, has a purpose for your life. He's created you to, to do things, and the things that he has created you to do are a gift to us. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do. He gives us the desire and the power both to will and to do of his what? Good purpose. He has a purpose for your life, and he's working in you to give you the desire and the power to do the good purpose. And these are the four universal purposes, or the four parts of the universal purpose that he has for us. It's what he's created us to do. And I will feel most alive, most useful, and most significant when I am doing what I was created to do. Now, that's why we, we exist in general. Why do you exist? Why do you exist? There's also, as I said, a sense, in, and this is written down on that purpose outline, there's also a sense in, in which each man is unique. And God takes these four uh, universals and he combines and particularizes them to each person so that there is a particular way that you can express loving God, loving people, great commission and the culture mandate. And that's your, that is your personal life purpose. The way that God has majestically, yeah, he sets you in a certain time and a place. He's uh, let you live during a certain era. He's made you of a certain mental acuity, a certain physical form, a certain amount of, 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 of aptitudes and abilities. You've gone to school and you have these acquired competencies. He can, he's given you spiritual gifts. He's, he has a calling on your life. All of these things, all of these things are a collage of your personal life purpose. Why you exist your reason for, for being. And a man can do nothing better than to wrestle with what God's purpose is for his life. Now, an excellent way to do that is for you to have a written life purpose statement that would be uh, based on a text of Scripture that speaks deeply into that little tortured chamber in your soul where you're wondering, what is my purpose? And so also on your tables is a worksheet for developing a written life purpose statement. Jesus had a personal life purpose. Luke chapter 19 uh, 10, I came to seek, my purpose is to seek and to save the lost. Paul had a purpose. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, 28 and 29, it was to present, to present every man, every person mature in Christ, to bring people to spiritual maturity. Uh, I've had a couple of life purposes. My first one was based on Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. I was just at a time in my life where that was what I needed. I needed to know, the, I needed to, uh, I had sought the God that I wanted for so long. I needed to know the God who is. 
And so that was my life purpose. And just to show you how life purposes can change, not short-term life goals, but over longer horizons, maybe 10 years or 20 years, life purpose, your life purpose can change. You might, you might have already fulfilled one of your life purposes, and, and you might be in a parenthesis. You might, you might think you're stuck, but you might actually just be on the blank page between chapters in your life, and you just need to wait on God to, to reveal the next level of purpose for your life. So, because I have these migraine headaches, and uh, which are now under control with medication, but uh, there was a, a point in my life when I was living on two verses. I've, I've talked about this here. Uh, you know, when you get to your own personal testimony, I think uh, I read Spurgeon, I can't remember how many times, but he said he gave his personal testimony, I don't know, 50 times at his church over the course of his career. And so this is part of my story, but it's a big part of my story because my purpose for the last, since we, in the same month we started this Bible study, I changed my life purpose based on 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Now, therefore, he who suffers in his body is done with sin. You can look up the full verse. But he says he, he will not spend the rest of his earthly life chasing after evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And it just dawned on me one day, suffering is a gift. Suffering has been God's gift to me. He who suffers in his body is done with sin. As a result, he will not spend the rest of his earthly life chasing after evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And so I wrote in the front of my Bible, in the month we started this Bible study, I will spend the rest of my earthly life for the will of God. That's my life purpose. So everything, if you've ever asked me to do anything, and uh, I hesitated, and you leaned in on me to get me to do it anyway, I probably have said to you, uh, look, I will do anything God wants me to do. But only that. <laughs> and so, because I'm just so, it's just so much of who I am is that I want to, I'm, I'm committed to spending the rest of my earthly life for the will of God. If, it's, if God's not in it, I'm not interested. That's just the way it is. And, and of course, the reason I got to that place is because I've done it so much the other way, you see, seeking the God that I wanted. And so the message for you would be to come, come to that place where you have your own personal gyroscope, your own personal compass, uh, a, a, a written statement hopefully, preferably based on a, 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 a scripture text that takes those four universal purposes and just sort of combines them and distills them all down to this pithy statement of your personal life purpose. Understanding and living out God's purpose is how we satisfy our need to be significant. Big idea, I'm going to feel most alive, useful, and significant when I am doing what God created me to do. Do you know what God has created you to do? I trust that most of you do, but I'm guessing that out of, out of the men, all the men that will, will hear this message, that there are many who are confused, either because they've never known their purpose, or they had a purpose once and now they've plateaued, or you know your purpose and you decided to be a dropout. It's time to drop back in. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, we come to you humbly. Uh, there is no way that we can ever be uh, alive and useful and significant uh, until we know what it is that you have created us to do, why we exist what our purpose is in life. And Lord, not just in the universal way, but we have to know that,
but also in the personal and specific way, the personal life purpose that you have for each of us. So uh, whether, uh, whether these men this morning, uh, some of them have uh, been confirmed in their life purpose, some of them have clarified their life purpose, uh, some of them realize they uh, need to, to work on this more carefully, some, some of us now understand why we've been so frustrated meeting goals because it hasn't been connected to a purpose, to a why. And so, Lord, whatever, whatever the case may be, I pray that you would superintend your gospel, your grace to each of these men and lead them to a clear understanding of what their purpose is, why they exist, and give them then the joy of being alive and useful and feeling significant. We ask this in your name. Amen.